AI in Action is brought to you by Aulus International, covering your business's staffing, consulting, and networking needs. Our host brings you the leading minds in AI, sharing their story, their success, and their advice. Focusing on fast-tracking you to the top, AI in Action cuts through the hype to help you kickstart your data science career. To listen to the latest AI in Action podcast, head over to www.aldus.com forward slash podcast, or subscribe via iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Podcasts. You're listening to AI in Action. I'm your host, JP Valentine. Our guest today is Charles Fisher. Charles is the CEO at Unlearn AI. Charles, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's our pleasure, Charles. So let's start with yourself. Can you give a brief overview of your background, uh, where you got started in tech, uh, what drew you to it, some of the roles you've held along the way, and, and take us up to just before you came up with the idea to form Unlearn. Of course. So I'm a a biophysicist by training. Uh, I did my bachelor's degree at the University of Michigan and a PhD at Harvard. And then I had every intention of going on to be a professor. So, so, yeah, I did my PhD and then I did multiple uh, postdocs, one in the Department of Physics at Boston University. And then I was a Philippe Meyer Fellow in Theoretical Physics at the Col de Maspirier in Paris. So, um, I had, like I said, I, I really had every intention of going on to be a, an academic researcher. But then, really about the time of my second postdoc, I was starting to wonder what was happening in this sort of shadow world of industry. Because when you're in academia, you you don't see any of it. It's Industry is this... The people who just call it industry, like like it's all all the same thing. So I, I was curious, um, and I had a, a friend of mine from grad school who was working as a machine learning scientist at Pfizer uh, in Boston. And so uh, I left Paris and went back to Boston to join Pfizer and worked there uh, as a computational biologist doing machine learning on mostly doing machine learning within clinical trials. So a lot of the goal there would be, we would run a phase two clinical trial, you would enroll maybe 200 patients, and we'd collect a whole lot of data on those patients. So, you know, biomarker data, brain imaging, blood tests, and then try to predict from the outcomes, which types of patients were most likely to benefit from these therapies. and uh, I always tell people that, that that doesn't work very well. <laughs> so I learned from my experience that, that that didn't work very well. But that's what we did. And um, at some point then I, I left Pfizer and moved out to San Francisco to work at a company called Leap Motion. And I was a machine learning engineer uh, developing machine learning methods for uh, uh, enabling native interactions in virtual reality environments. So the idea there was that you basically had a camera that would capture the positions or take pictures of your hands. And then we would try to use that information to enable somebody to interact with the virtual environment through the hands. And um, so that is the one sort of really different experience that I had, that's sort of the tech experience, because my whole career was focused on uh, machine learning and computational modeling and biology. And then I did this transition job into into tech uh, at Leap Motion, um, and I didn't stay there particularly long. But that's where I met my co-founders, uh, John and Aaron. Uh, we we ended up leaving to to start Unlearn. Excellent. Well, thank you for that, Charles. I appreciate it. So, following on from where you left off, can you walk us through the the the, the idea behind Unlearn? What was the the formation of it? Where you guys saw an opportunity in the market, and then give the overview of what you're trying to accomplish. Unlearn's evolved a lot from the day when we started it. Um, so you know, the original sort of idea, I say even pre-idea, you know, we all ended up leaving Leap Motion at the same time. So this was three of other machine learning scientists, and we just started having lunches <laughs> basically like two or three times a week and thinking about what we wanted to do next. Um, and when we were having a lot of these conversations, you know, it, uh, most of them centered around the state of machine learning research. 
Um, and when we were looking at sort of that whole field writ large, it's primarily dominated by uh, a handful of companies. So there are companies like Google and Facebook and Microsoft who, you know, Amazon, all these companies like drive the research agenda in machine learning. And I think that's fine, except that, that there are whole areas of application where not much research has really been done. I mean, if you think about it, like for medicine, you know, that we're talking about 0.1% of the investment into machine learning research has gone into machine learning for medicine. So the original idea was that actually, if we thought about how we could solve machine learning problems in medicine, that it, this would just allow us to do interesting machine learning research. <laughs> and we would, we would discover new techniques in machine learning because we would be focusing on this particular problem that where the, not much focus had been paid before. So that was really the original sort of founding principle. Um, and we initially started thinking about some things in clinical trials, primarily just because I had had some experience in, in clinical trials when I was at Pfizer. So we were, we were thinking, okay, well, there, there's these problems that people encounter in clinical trials, such, such as um, trying to create uh, disease progression models of how patients with a particular disease will progress if they're just given currently available therapies, as well as other things like looking at genomic biomarkers, all this kind of stuff. So the early days formation of the company was more about learning about machine learning than it was learning about medicine. So then it's obviously evolved over time. So can you walk us through the journey over well, what is coming up on uh, four years now and the current iteration of Unlearn, what you guys are doing on a day-to-day -day basis and what it's like to be part of the, the data team? Any startup company is always iterative. I, I mean, I, the, one of the whole keys to building a sex, successful startup is I think that you want to have like a core principle that you're trying to hold on to. Um, but then everything around that principle, you need to be flexible and learn from feedback. Um, and that fits really well with the way data science and machine learning research is done. The truth is that data science and machine learning are empirical disciplines. We don't know whether or not something is going to work before you try it. <laughs> you, you, don't, you can't say like, I'm going to get an AUC. Uh, 0.9 on this prediction problem. You, you don't know. You have to actually get the data. You have to try to build the algorithm and then see how well it works. And so that's kind of the what we went through in the in the early days and how we iterated through things. We had a couple of different problems that we wanted to try to address. Um, one of them is you know how we could like I said how we could build these disease progression models. So it's basically using generative neural networks to try to simulate patient progression. So we'll have a, a patient, they'll enroll in a trial, you collect all this information. We wanna simulate how all of those different characteristics will evolve over, over time uh, in, in the course of the trial. And so the, you know, what we basically did there is we started working on that problem using some publicly available data and then signed a, uh, signed a small partnership with Pfizer uh, to work on um, work on some some things in Alzheimer's disease related to that particular type of problem. So how we could model disease progression in Alzheimer's. And at simultaneously, we signed another pro project with Pfizer that was looking at how we could use sort of generative modeling uh, to understand RNA sequencing data. So could we predict, for example, what would happen if you knocked out a particular gene or something like that. Um, and essentially what happened is that we, we ended up developing a method that was very, very successful at modeling disease progression. And on the other hand, our method that we were working on to model gene expression did not work very well. <laughs> so, so, we looked, so we looked at those, at those two possibilities, right? And we were like, well, empirically, this disease progression thing that's working very, very well, and the gene expression thing is not, and so we, we were able to then focus uh, our, our business going forward. 
Makes sense. And I appreciate you being so candid about, you know, having to assess what's working and what's not. But, you know, anyone who's in a startup will be listening and nodding because we can all relate. Um, so can you give us some insight into the, the here and now from where you've grown over the last four years? Current makeup of the team and, you know, what a typical day in the life of your, your data science machine learning uh, team looks like. Just at the beginning of this year, sort of move from the kind of like R&D phase to really commercializing our technology. Um, and that means that, you know, there are basically four different types of activities, very, very high level that, that we tend to be involved with. And this is across the organization because at a small startup, you know, where we have right now about 20, 25 employees, people wear many hats, right? So even if you're a data scientist, you might get called into a meeting with a customer and try to explain something, right? Yeah. Um, so the, the different activities, so um, one is really like regulatory. So we do a lot of work uh, on interacting with either consortia, public consortia, or directly with the FDA and EMA and other regulatory agencies um, to demonstrate that the approaches that we are developing uh, can be used safely within clinical trials. This is really, really key, really, really key thing. And, and this actually then takes us a little bit beyond what you might think of as people would traditionally think of as being data science or machine learning and actually having to do a lot of st fundamental like statistics research, like proving theorems and things like this. Um, and then and then presenting all that information to the regulators. So that's, that's one activity. Um, the second one then is just commercial, right? So the com and commercial means having conversations with customers um, and giving presentation, interacting with existing clients and potential clients, um, and as well as marketing. So writing, uh, white papers, things like that to describe our approach. Um, then there is what I would call data science. And data science is the act of taking all of these data um, often cleaning and, and incorporating data from different sources and kind of understanding the data, creating a data set, and then training sort of models to uh, predict disease progression in, in various diseases. Then the last activity is, is engineering. And engineering to us incorporates, uh, well, software engineering, but also machine learning research. So these are, this is kind of building the tools that the data scientists and statisticians can use um, downstream to uh, build in, in these disease progression models and then incorporate them into trials. Thank you for that overview. It, it's good to hear you break it down into different segments so people can actually visualize the, the, the key areas that make all this work and come together. Charles, what, what are some of the big challenges that you and your team face on a on a day-to-day -day basis and, and what do you have to do to overcome them? There are really three main sets of challenges that we tend to have to deal with. The first one, sort of at the, at the most technical level, is in engineering. And we are using proprietary, actually really novel machine learning methods. So we're not using the same kinds of algorithms that really anyone else in the world is using. Uh, we have patent applications on the approaches that we use because they're so different. Um, and that that difference is not, it's not like on purpose. It's driven by the kinds of data and problems that we're working on. Again, this going back to that, what I said at the beginning of like why we started the company, it was, well, if we focus on these problems, which no one else has really worked on, we will have to develop new machine learning techniques to solve them. And so that that is what we've done. The result of that, though, is that we're not using like any infrastructure that like other people are using. So, so you think about like all of the open source machine learning tools and data science tools that people have developed, none of those really work well uh, for the problem and, and, the, and the solution that we've developed. So we have to actually build a lot of our software ourselves. And we work in a regulated environment, so we have to satisfy various FDA and regulatory requirements on that software. So th that's actually a lot of, of challenge there is not only are we you know implementing these new methods but we have to do it in a way that satisfies the regulatory agency so that's one one challenge um, I think a second major challenge is trying to educate the market uh, about these new technologies and in particular 
uh, you know, we sit at the intersection of three really technical areas. So we do machine learning, and that's obviously a very technical area. We do a lot of statistics research, another technical area, and all of that is applied to a problem in clinical research, you know, medicine, the third technical area. And the thing is that each of these areas is very highly technical. They don't speak each other's language at all. And it is, but even machine learning and statistics, you might think that those two groups would have a lot of overlap. And they really don't, actually. Machine learning researchers and statisticians tend to actually disagree and not get along on lots and lots of issues. So trying to craft a message in which we can explain what we do, why it's uh, appropriate, and why it's valuable, that appeals to each one of these audiences is a, is a major challenge. Um, and so we spend a lot of time talking with people in these audiences and thinking about how we can how we can better educate each of these groups about the concerns of the other and then explain how our particular solution uh, can be used to solve these problems in clinical trials within that context. So looking ahead now, Charles, obviously an incredible four years for you and your team, uh, taking it from you and the founders to now a, a team of, I believe it's, are you guys at almost 30 people and growing? We are about 25 people, but yeah, rapidly growing. Excellent, excellent. Well, I, I want to get your take on, on what's in store uh, and I'm going to come at it two ways. What are you most excited about for Unlearn and the, the, the future of the business? And then when you think of the big objective, where do you see this technology, this industry and the overall impact going over the next few years? So taking the first part, what am I most excited about? You know, for me, one of the big reasons to transition from academia into industry is the ability to have an impact a rapid impact on real world problems. Uh, and in particular, you know, with my background in, in biology and medicine, these are fields that really lag behind the adoption of technology. So we always see, we see technology being adopted in tons and tons of other places, and then biology and medicine like 10, 15 years later. Um, and so the ability to actually now be at this point where we are commercializing our technology. So we spent, you know, three years doing R&D and building this technology. And now we're at the point where we're actually using it in clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease. We will be using it in clinical trials for multiple sclerosis soon. And we'll be able to actually have that real impact on medical research and ultimately on patients. Um, that's a really, really key important thing. And for us, one of the uh, main sort of inflection points that has gotten us to that to that to this particular point where we can now start to commercialize the technology is actually in the statistics research. So you know we had done this work on building these disease progression models. So using these deep neural networks to simulate how patients will progress. Uh, say with Alzheimer's disease, and we, we published a paper uh, uh, in one of the Nature journals a couple, maybe like three, almost three years ago, like two or three years ago, we published that paper. Um, and so there's that gap in time between idea and not even idea, I mean, a, a peer-reviewed published paper to actually something that we can get to market. And a lot of that was, was one, develop, doing some statistics research, and then two, developing the messaging so that we can go and talk to uh, physicians, we can talk to the FDA and EMA and explain why this particular approach that we are uh, proposing is scientifically rigorous, right? Why the in the end, the results you're going to get out of those clinical trials are going to be uh, valid and robust and easily interpretable. So we're not trying to make, I think in the end, you know, there's lots and lots of solutions that are out there where people are trying to come up with ways to take these long and expensive clinical trials and make them more efficient. But you can't lower the bar of evidence when you do that, right? Like we still need to get really robust, reliable evidence out of it. And so we've really made that transition in the past year of being able to really rigorously prove and, and, and explain 
um, why the approach that we are proposing not only leads to trials that are twice as fast, but ensures that you still get robust, reliable evidence out of them. So that's that's what I'm really excited about, is now taking all that we've learned from that and really starting to make these trials in Alzheimer's and MS better. Amazing. And then in terms of where we're going from there, the approaches that we have developed are widely applicable across, across different therapeutic areas. And I think this is an advantage of coming at these problems from a AI, machine learning, data science framework, um, is that we're just data-driven. We are a data-driven company. We have deep neural networks that are making these simulations of, uh, of disease progression. So we're not like putting in mechanisms or things we think about the biology of a particular disease. We put in data and we let these neural networks figure out how they should use those data to create these simulations. And then the statistical methods that we use to incorporate those simulations into trials don't say anything specific about which given disease area they are. They say some things about the types of outcomes that are measured, but they're widely applicable. So this is, this is an approach that we can really quite, uh, I don't wanna say easily, but we, we, can, we can definitely scale across different therapeutic areas. Um, and so over the next, say, five years, you know, our goal is to have this approach widely adopted. Uh, I often say that I think, I think that we should have a 100% market share, that every single clinical trial in every single therapeutic area that is run should really use the approach that we are proposing. Um, and the reason is that we can actually demonstrate it can only make clinical trials better. It, it can never lead to a bias and it can only make them higher powered and more efficient. So it should just always be used. Um, and so that, you know, seeing that forward, uh, if we have applied this approach across all clinical trials, all therapeutic areas, it's, a, it's really a two times speed up in medical research as a whole. And the impact that that could have um, on getting uh, more innovative treatments, getting those treatments to patients faster, and decreasing the cost in the end of the drugs that patients receive would, would be a really big impact. So I, I think over the next, say, five or 10 years, as we start to really see this expand across, across therapeutic areas, being able to measure those impacts, not just, say, the, the machine learning research where we started this company, but now on the actual impact to patients, I think will be really exciting. Absolutely. Um, Final question from me, Charles, is to look at the people side of your business, obviously growing, growing it from you and your founders to where you're at now and uh, aggressively growing in, in 2021. Can you give us some insight into what you've learned in, in building a team from a pure startup? You know, what do you look for? Um, what advice you can offer to others who are looking to make that transition from academia to industry? So I think that there are a few different answers to to that um so if i start with the first thing like what is my number one piece of advice would be to iterate <laughs> to iteration is key at startups and therefore it's really important that when you are thinking about interviewing people that you find people who are comfortable with that not everybody likes rapid iteration cycles or is comfortable saying like well i just I just made this presentation, let me throw it in the trash and make it again, right? <laughs> because it wasn't good enough. Um, and at a startup, you just have to have that attitude. You are going to iterate on everything until it reaches the bar that it needs to be. Um, and it's not, it's your, your initial attempt is always not gonna be good enough. So you're always gonna be throwing it out and starting it over again on everything. And finding people that fit with that, um, sort of that way of working is just crucial um, for being able to, to be successful, have them be successful at a startup. So in the next 12 months, we're hiring people from uh, really across the organization, um, hiring data scientists, hiring software and machine learning engineers, uh, hiring a number of statisticians, and hiring people on the uh, commercial side as well uh, for finance, for product, for uh, strategy, 
all of these different areas we'll, we'll be hiring for the next year. So we're, we're planning on really basically doubling the size of the company uh, in 2021. So there's a lots and lots of different roles. Um, and all of those roles, if anyone's interested in how, you know, getting involved in how they could use machine learning uh, to improve medical research and, and clinical trials. You can find all of our different roles on our website uh, at unlearn.ai. And then the last question, so my advice for transitioning from academia to industry. It depends a lot. So I, I'm going to take this with one uh, with kind of a narrow view. So transitioning from something in academia into industry data science or machine learning. Um, and so for that particular transition, my advice to people is to study more software engineering. <laughs> um, and like I, you know, so many people want it to be about, um, you know, doing interesting modeling, uh, interesting statistics, understanding those things. But in the end, what really, really is the bottleneck in many cases in, in industry is that people are going to have to write not just scripts like that you write in academia. You write a script and the script does the analysis for your paper. But in, in industry, we need to write software projects, whole ecosystems with hundreds of thousands, millions of lines of code. And you have a variety of people who are collaborating, maybe dozens, maybe a hundred people who are going to be collaborating on the same code base. Um, we, in our case, like we have to worry about regulatory audit, like they could come in and say, well, we want to look at your code base and uh, see all the documentation and make sure it's validated and has appropriate testing. And so, um, but all of that stuff is not really emphasized typically in academia. You know, how do you use GitHub? How do you document code? How do you write a specification for your code before you actually go ahead and start just writing it? Most people that I know in academia, you just open up your Jupyter notebook and you just start coding stuff. Uh, and that's just not how it's done in industry. So, so the, I, the biggest piece of advice that I have for people who want to get involved in, in, in industry coming from academia is to think about how they can improve those aspects of their software engineering. And so you could try to get involved in open source projects or things like that uh, that could help. I mean, for me, this was the biggest thing that I learned when I transitioned from academia to industry. I mean, the biggest, biggest difference was that I learned how to code. Um, I actually learned how to write software. Like, I was a computational scientist in uh, academia. I did my PhD in the, the MIT's computational biophysics group. We wrote tons and tons and tons of code, but it wasn't software. Um, and that, that was the really biggest difference that I learned uh, when I moved to industry. And so that's, that's where I would recommend people who want to be industry data science focus uh, their initial time. Excellent. Charles, we really appreciate you coming on today, talking to us about your background. Um, sounds incredible what you're working on at Unlearn. Um, exciting growth ahead. So we wish you and your team all the best. Thank you again. Thanks for having me. AI in Action is brought to you by Aulus International, covering your business's staffing, consulting, and networking needs. Aulus offer an exec search program. Aulus can help you discover how data science and AI can transform your company. With our unrivaled network of C-suite executives and senior AI professionals, we offer retained search services across the US and Europe. Get the Aulus advantage. Become a member of the Aulus community and enjoy some of the following. AI meetups. Once a month, our community gathers to listen to some of the leading experts in the world of data science and AI. Our speakers come from all over the world, including Dublin, Boston, and Frankfurt. We also have our AI mentors. Our experts will provide mentoring to all us members. And don't forget our AI on Action podcast. Each week, we have guests from all over the world talking us through their education, career, and more. Become an Aldus member and get the Aldus advantage. For more information and to sign up for our newsletter, log on to www.aldus.com. That's www.aldus.com. Aldus International, empowering through AI.